Travel to almost any city, town or hamlet in Australia and New Zealand and the chances are you will find some sort of memorial to the Anzac soldiers of the Great War. But of the thousands of memorials found across the country, this one here in Mullumbimby in the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales, Australia, has special significance to me. And that's because of four names that it represents. Just here across the road in the ex-servicemen's club, those four names are found on the honour roll. They are Samuel Laverty, Joseph Laverty, George Laverty and Percy Tolk. Samuel Laverty is my grandfather, Joseph, his older brother, George, his younger brother, and Percy Tolk was their best friend and brother-in-law, married to their sister, Essie. This war has left its mark on our landscape, but the mark it has left on our national souls and family hearts is even greater. My grandfather fought in this war, as did his brother and his brother-in-law. And on my wife's side, her grandfather also volunteered, as did three of his brothers. I'm taking the opportunity of exploring the First World War Anzacs in our family. We're going to track down the men behind the pictures and fragments of memory that are part of our family heritage and discover our own connections to the Great War. So join us as we embark on a journey of discovery back into history to discover secrets from the past. I'm sure there are going to be lots of surprises along the way. As we set out to discover the Anzacs in our family tree, our first task is to collect all we know about our grandfathers. So I've come to the town of Mullumbimby in the Byron Shire. The town is nestled at the foot of Mount Shinkogan in the Brunswick Valley, about 10 kilometers from the coast and the Pacific Ocean. The name Mullumbimby was given to the district by the Bunjalung Aboriginal people, possibly because of the proximity of Mount Shinkogan. My mother's grandfather, Samuel Laverty, migrated to Australia from County Down in Northern Ireland in 1885 on the immigration ship Belgic. He and his wife, Emma, established a farm here at Wilson's Creek near Mullumbimby, where they raised their family of six children four boys and two girls. This was called the Estate Farm, and they became prominent dairy farmers in the community. And the area leading up to the farm still carries the family name today, Laverty's Gap, as do a couple of other streets in the area. The war brought home issues of faith to many soldiers, including my grandfather. He drew strength from his faith and took a keen interest in the Bible and spiritual matters that lasted all his life. In fact, at one stage, he even contemplated becoming a clergyman. While on leave, he visited Northern Ireland where he met his future wife, Mary Jane Dillon. After the war, Samuel came home and established this dairy farm for himself and his future wife. He then returned to Northern Ireland and married Mary Jane Dillon and brought his wife back here where they settled on this farm on the outskirts of Mullumbimby and raised a family of 11 children. As the children grew older and more land was required, the family acquired another farm here on the outskirts of Mullumbimby. Yes, well, Gary, uh, this is your family tree and uh, this is you here and this is your mother, Jean. Mm -hmm. And this is her father, Samuel Robert. So my grandfather. Your grandfather. The one who went to war. The one who went to war. Right. And his father was Samuel Robert. Same name. Same name. And he came out to Australia from County Down in Ireland. So that's the family. That's well, the I family. Never... 
All right, now, how many children were there in my, my grandfather's family? How many siblings did he have? He had six children. Um, Joseph, yes. the eldest, and then Essie. Uh -huh. uh, Samuel. My grandfather. Your grandfather. George. Yes. Alma. Uh -huh. And Robert. Four boys? Four boys. Two girls. Two girls, yes. Now, of the four boys, how many of them enlisted? The three oldest, Joseph. So do we have any pictures of Joseph? Joseph, this is Joseph okay. in the light horse uniform. Aha. Uh -huh. He was a handsome fellow. Yes, tall. very tall, very tall, well now, over six foot. They say that all the boys were great horsemen yes. and crack shots. They were. So that's, uh, that's, that's, yes. so that's the oldest. Now yeah. who came next? And, and then your grandfather, uh, Samuel Robert. Yes. Uh, machine gunner. Right. So this is him here. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. And the next boy was George. Oh, this is the youngest. Yes. The youngest one who enlisted. Yes. Okay. He, and he obviously was in the light horse. Now, what about Essie's husband, Percy Tull? Essie's husband, uh, this is a photo, this is all, oh, this all is we Percy. have, that's of Percy. All right, so he, he left for the, uh, the battlefields yes. soon after he was married? Yes, yes. Okay. These days it's pretty easy to find out their service records in the National Australian Archives on the internet. However, I'm going to get some professional help so that I can really understand what all these documents mean. Dr. Daniel Reno, Associate Professor of History at Avondale College of Higher Education, has studied the stories of many Anzac soldiers and will guide me through my search. Daniel, I'm interested in finding out the details of my grandfather's war record, his war history. So how do we go about that? Well, that's very simple. First of all, we'll go to the National Archives of Australia. I've got the home page up here. To record search, we'll go to the middle to name search, and up we get family name. So, your grandfather's family name. Laverty. Laverty. And we select a category of record. It is World War I. Search. There are 15 Lavertys who served in the First World War. We can refine this search result. First name? Samuel. OK, we see we've got the records here. First page. We find his name when he enlists. Uh, and click here, age. He's 18 years and one month old. Now, his unit is the 3rd Machine Gun Battalion. Uh -huh. That means that he's not an infantryman. He's in the supporting units, lugging those big, heavy Vickers machine guns around, um, firing in support of the infantry that are attacking. So he's on the Western Front. He's on the Western York. Front. Now, he's involved yeah. in key battles from the, from the time that he's there. You can yeah. see Villers Bretonneux, very famous site. Uh -huh. he, he's there in action. Battle of Hamel, Mont Saint-Quentin. See, he's wounded there. Right. That, that's around the time of the Hindenburg outpost yeah. attack. But it's a light wound because he's not evacuated. Yeah. You know, I can, I can remember my grandfather when I was young talking about he had aches and pains and referring to the injury, uh, the wound he, he must have received here that, that's, that's recorded. OK. OK, so now let's go to the brothers that we noticed there. Yes, two, two brothers. His older brother was Joseph. Joseph, Joseph, OK. So we bring up Joseph and here we go. Oh, look at this. August 1914. Right at the beginning of the war. He's, he's keen. Uh-huh. And he joins the 2nd Australian Light Horse Brigade. Ah. Country boy, is he? Country boy off the farm. Familiar with horse riding. Now, another brother. That's George Albert. OK, George, here we go. He enlists in October 1918. So that's the end of, towards the end of the war? Uh, yes. The war finishes the next month, and if we click here, we see, no, he's discharged no, no almost active, immediately. So no active service. No active service. So the three brothers all enlisted, but only two of them would have actually seen service. That's right. The 2nd Light Horse Regiment landed here on the 9th of May 
1915. Daniel, as I look at the sheer cliffs here, and I can't help wondering why Joe and the Light Horse were here at Anzac Cove. Well, you're right. It's not really horse country, is it? But that's the point. The Light Horse actually left their horses behind in Egypt and came over as foot soldiers because that's what was needed for this campaign. So the second regiment of the Light Horse were sent up Monash Valley to the ridge line at Quinn's Post. So this is Quinn's Post, high on the Gallipoli Ridge. It is. It's the absolutely crucial place on Gallipoli. And what would it have meant to Joseph to be here? Well, this place decides whether the Anzac forces can stay or go, or whether the Turks are under threat. You can see how narrow the ridge is mm -hmm. here. And if the Turks could overlook this side of the ridge, they'd look right down Monash Valley, and no Australian could move without danger. On the other hand, if the Aussies can take this other side, then they do the same to the Turks. So this point decides the success or failure of either side. So here we find the key battles on May 15, the second light horse with Joseph attack, trying to push the Turks back. On May 18, 19, the Turks counterattack. Heavy losses here. The truce of May 24, when they clear the bodies from this battlefield, all happen in this tiny space of ground. So this was a critical location in the course of the Gallipoli campaign. A lot depended on what happened here and to think that Joseph was involved right here in all of this. Mm -hmm. And I imagine with the opposing forces being so, so close to each other, there must have been continual action and so continual fear and stress and, and, uh, and, and tension. Constantly on alert because they're always raiding each other trying to take this key point. So what we have here is what's left of an old Australian trench. We've come about 250 metres up from Quinn's Post. So what's Joseph doing here in these trenches? Well, after the May battles, the second light horse occupy these trenches at the top of Pope's Hill, facing the Turkish line, a bit further away than they are at Quinn's Post, and holding the fort. So how long is he here for? Well, he's here from late May until early August. So what's he doing for two and a half months? Basically keeping an eye on the Turk, the occasional sniping, a bit of a skirmish, maybe some grenade throwing, they called them bombs, artillery from time to time, but it is fairly routine, boring work. The soldier's life has been described as 99% boredom, 1% terror. So here we are back at Quinn's Post. Joseph returns for the August offensive. What was that all about? Well, it's the last desperate attempt by the British to make a success of the Gallipoli campaign. So they've planned huge landings north in Suvla Bay. The Kiwis are going to try to take the heights and the Australians are playing a supporting role. Down at Lone Pine, there's a diversionary battle on the 6th. And here and at the Neck, on the 7th and 8th, the Light Horse are attacking to pin the Turks down in this area so that they can't attack the Kiwis. So with all this fighting taking place at probably one of the most dangerous places on, on Gallipoli, Joseph was fortunate to survive, wasn't he? He, he is, he is, because he's been here for three critical battles. The May 15 attack, the counter-attack by the Turks, same month, and then this August attack. And they're attacking very well-prepared positions, very alert Turkish troops who are expecting an attack at any time. This is incredibly dangerous place to be. Joseph is very, very fortunate to come out of the, all of this unscathed. And after these intense and dangerous battles, Joseph succumbed not to bullets or bombs, but to something much less threatening. He was evacuated on the 1st of September to the Greek island of Lemnos, suffering from an ingrown toenail. But it was actually very serious. It was so bad that it prevented him from moving around easily. And he was also debilitated, most probably, from the severe dysentery that affected so many of the troops here, that he had to be sent to England for treatment and was out of action for six months. When he recovered, it was to find himself 
back in Egypt. Bir El Romana on the Sinai coast is not far from the Suez Canal. In 1916, this place was known as Romani and was the front line between the Turkish Empire, which controlled Palestine, and the British forces protecting the vital Suez Canal. In 1916, Joseph Laverty rejoined the 2nd Light Horse Regiment at Romani near the Suez Canal. He was immediately engaged in building defences and undertaking reconnaissance patrols east and south into the desert. In July, Turkish forces built up for a major offensive, and the light horse were active in finding out their movements, patrolling often daily out to the oasis at Katia. In early August, the Turks attacked. The Light Horse defeated the Turks at the Battle of Romani and then pushed them back to Katia. Two more battles at Majdaba and Rafa brought the British forces to the border of Palestine. Over the next year, Joseph's regiment would take part in three great battles, one of them a defeat and the other two decisive victories. They were the Second Battle of Gaza in April 1917, the Battle of Beersheba in October, and the Third Battle of Gaza in November. These last two battles broke the Turkish defences in southern Palestine, and the British troops began a rapid advance along the coast road into Palestine. Two more battles at Musha Ridge and Nabi Samuel opened the way for the capture of Jerusalem. But Joseph missed them all. Although he was in line from June to September, he was absent, sick with fever, during the second Gaza campaign, which was perhaps fortunate for him, and then sent to a Hotchkiss machine gunner's course at Zaitun. On his return, he probably helped operate one of the regiment's Hotchkiss machine guns. Then in September, he was hospitalised again, this time with a serious case of shingles. Jerusalem, the most sacred city in the world and the most important one in Bible history. How did Joseph Laverty and the other Anzacs react to being in the Holy Land? Well, we often think of them as very secular men, and they were. But to be honest, they were absolutely fascinated by the history around them. Right from the time they arrived in Egypt and through to the boat sailing to Gallipoli and the waters Paul sailed through, and then here in the Holy Land, they are pestering the chaplains for information, for stories, to get knowledge about all of these places. In Egypt, they wanted to know about Moses and the Exodus, they wanted to know about Mary and Joseph bringing baby Jesus down into exile because there's a traditional place where they stopped on their way to Egypt. They also wanted to know about Paul and his missionary journeys. Then here in Israel, they're asking questions about Abraham and Beersheba. They're asking for stories about David capturing Jerusalem. They're walking the Via Dolorosa, following the path of Jesus to his crucifixion. Then going down to Jericho, they want the stories of Joshua, Rahab and the spies. Then up to Megiddo, a popular interpretation was of Armageddon, the final battle of history. And they were fascinated with the plains of Megiddo where that story was set. And then through to Nazareth, the hometown of Jesus. So these Anzacs, were keen to find out these stories. Their letters and diaries show they were very passionate religious visitors to the Holy Land. These are the legendary plains of Megiddo, the site of a number of great battles in history, 
It also gives its name to the great apocalyptic conflict known as the Battle of Armageddon, mentioned in the book of Revelation in the Bible. Here in September 1918, Allenby carried out his last master stroke, the complete destruction of the Turkish army in Palestine, opening the floodgates for a run straight to Damascus. Allenby's main force advanced across the plains of Megiddo, sweeping into Nazareth, where they almost captured the German general commanding the Turkish army at his headquarters at the Casanova Monastery. In the meantime, Joseph's unit formed part of Chateau's force on Allenby's right wing, protecting the main attack. Once it had cut loose, Chateau's force captured the crossing at the Jordan River, then swept up through Jordan, taking Amman, then capturing huge numbers of Turkish forces east of the Jordan River. This was Joseph Laverty's last significant action in the Great War. In October, he was again evacuated sick, and soon the war was over. As an original Anzac, he was slated for the earliest possible return to Australia. And in mid-December, he took ship for home. In the meantime, his younger brother Samuel had signed up and after training in the Machine Gun Corps, left Australia in November 1917. He too was out of action several times through illness, spending a month in Alexandria recovering but he was destined for France, not Palestine. My grandfather's older sister, Essie, married Percy Tolk. Percy enlisted in January 1916 and served in France and later in Belgian Flanders and was killed in action in the Battle of Passchendaele on the 20th of September 1917. His body was never identified or recovered. We went in search of his name on the Menem Gate Memorial to the Missing in Ypres, Belgium. This memorial is dedicated to British and Commonwealth soldiers who were killed in the Ypres salient of World War I and whose graves are unknown. Percy Tolk was one of them. And it was here among the missing that we found his name, his name engraved, Percy Tolk. By the time my grandfather, Samuel Laverty, arrived here in Villers Bretonneux in June 1918, the war had taken a turn in favour of the Allies. Having beaten the Russians in 1917, the Germans threw all their forces on the Western Front, hoping for a quick victory before the newly arriving Americans could turn the tide. In April, their attack came perilously close to cracking the British Fifth Army. But the Australians helped hold the line, most famously here at Villers Bretonneux, where their accomplishments are still remembered. On the 4th of July 1918, General John Monash, commander of the Australian Corps, fought his model battle here at Hamel. Samuel's unit wasn't involved in the initial battle, but helped in consolidating the gains in mid-July. From here, Samuel took part in the great advance, called the 100 Days, from the 8th of August to the 11th of November, which saw the defeat of Germany. As part of the Australian Corps, he advanced from Hamel through Chapillian Bray, which the Australians captured in August. Then his unit played a minor part in the great victory at Mont St. Quintin in early September. It was near here that the Australians fought their last battle, cracking the famous Hindenburg outpost line on the 18th and 19th of September. And it was here that Samuel received his one and only war wound. But it wasn't so severe that he needed to leave the unit for treatment. This Anzac journey has helped me discover what shaped the lives of my family. As we visited the locations 
learned of the dangers they experienced and the hardships they endured. As I've seen where they lived, fought and died, I've watched the story unfold. I've discovered that my ancestors form an integral part of my own identity. I've realized how my grandfather's values, his dedication, his faith, his love of the Bible and its message have been passed on to me and future generations. And I've discovered that my ancestors form an integral part, not only of my own identity, but that of our nation as well. If you would like to find out more about the Anzacs and their experiences with God, then I'd like to recommend our free booklet for you today. It contains inspirational stories of our fighting men, officers, soldiers, chaplains, as they fought, worshipped, prayed, sang and trusted God in the hell of Gallipoli. Our free gift is the booklet, The Faith of the Anzacs. I guarantee these stories will lift your spirits and lead your thoughts to a faith that works in the trials and tests of life. This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. There are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make the most of this wonderful opportunity to share in the testimonies of the Anzacs. Phone or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand. Or visit our website tij.tv or simply scan the QR code on your screen and we'll send you today's free offer totally free of charge and with no obligation. Write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia or P.O. Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed our journey to Gallipoli in the footsteps of the Anzacs and our reflections on their courage, loyalty and commitment, then be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then... Let's pray to the same God that the Anzacs did. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for our families and for our family history and heritage. Many of us have family members who have fought in some of the great battles for Australia. We are in awe of the commitment they showed to their country and to their beliefs. We want to honour their memory and remember their courage during times of hardship. We ask you to bless us and our families today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.